question is what gets cut in discretionary spending. So obviously Republicans targeting clean energy tax credits. That may be a red line for President Biden. So we wanted to get the take from someone kind of in the middle of that space. Dustin Kavanaugh, he's the CEO of Loop Global. It's an EV charging company. Um, D Dustin, do you have to hedge the possibility that some of the IRA gets rolled back Hey, thanks for having me. Um, definitely, I think the IRA tax credits obviously do a great job in subsidizing the uh, front cost of purchasing an electric vehicle, which as you know, comes at a premium to gas-powered vehicles in these early years of EV adoption. Um, but I don't necessarily think that eliminating the credit would slow down EV adoption um, as the train has kind of already left the station. Uh, all OEMs are in the process of uh, you know, converting their fleets to electric vehicles. It's just, it would really hurt in stimulating the early growth of EV adoption if these tax credits were taken away. So I think it would be a mistake to be taken away at this time. Dustin, clearly the, UV, the EVs are flying off the shelves at the moment. A lot of people are buying them. In fact, EV sales are clearly outpacing uh, the availability of charging stations around the country. This is now critical infrastructure. If we're selling this many cars, we're going to need the infrastructure to back it up. Are we going to continue to see government support if we have problems with the debt ceiling, if we do need to see some of the cuts coming through? Because this now looks like this, this, is, this is a utility, you could argue, for America. Yeah, yeah, and that's correct. I think we're going to continue to see government support um, beyond the IRA. We already have the NEVI program. That's a federal funded program uh, to help subsidize the uh, fast charging infrastructure uh, that's going to be deployed across highway corridors. That's a multi-billion dollar program that's being rolled out over the next five years to once again reduce range anxiety and really to accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles, um, which range anxiety, as you know, is probably mm -hmm. the biggest concern of EV drivers. Um, so, you know, these incentives are underway, um, but, but naturally, even down to the utility level, um, there are incentives and rebates that are available that are helping to subsidize and, and introduce uh, um, EVs. So, Dustin, in the meantime, everything is status quo. What we're also seeing is a tightening in financial conditions and certain banks uh, constricting lending and going under. Are you noticing any um, lack of credit that you need? Well, I, I think, of course, credits help subsidize. They help increase the payback on, you know, adoption. Um, but in my space and EV charging infrastructure, it's really a unique opportunity for property owners to actually add to their bottom line, uh, to turn their parking lots into profit centers. So it's not a capex expense that they're considering. It's really a, an addition to their revenue stream by being able to offer EV charging services to their tenants, employees, and customers. So you know, regardless of uh, you know whether these credits exist, it's something that has a yep. payback to it that ultimately is an investment into their property. Alex, Dustin talks about range anxiety, but, but I would go even a step further than that. Range anxiety is one factor. There's plenty of others. Do you know that when you get to the charger, it's actually going to be working? Because that, it turns out, is quite a big issue. <laughs> Do we have some sort of commonality in terms of the charging infrastructure when you get there? Are you going to be part of the right payment system in order to use that piece of infrastructure? You, I, I do wonder whether actually one of the factors that the government should be including in this is actually some sort of a ubiquitous system that we can all use, yeah. that works, that we can all access. These are critical issues which, I, again, I don't think we're talking enough about. So uh, I, I feel like that raises a good point that like we have a value chain of green energy transition, right? And you can look at it from EVs, mm -hmm. you can look at it from oil, carbon capture, whatever. And we don't yet know yep. like how it all winds up working together because we've never really done it before and then how to be profitable. So Dustin, can you help us shed some light on that? Like Guy uh, outlined a range of issues. We also have things like hydrogen cars could be coming down, cars powered by uh, e-fuel. So we don't even need an EV. Where do you make money? How can you guarantee, say, profitability in this supply chain? Yeah, in terms of standardizing the experience like Guy brought up, I think that that's a great point. Um, ultimately, the, the industry itself is kind of committing to an open charge point protocol communication standard so that everyone is using kind of the, the same methodology for uh, being able to uh, activate a charging session um, uh, regardless of what type of vehicle you have or what type of charger you go up uh, to work 
with. Um, I know that one of the problems that you brought up was that a lot of these existing solutions, you don't know if you're going to go up there and it's even going to work. You know, that, that's just one of the uh, issues that uh, some of these first generation charger solutions in the market um, have created where uh, they only provide the hardware. They're not yep. providing ongoing network you know, management or application, which tends to be a problem. So ultimately, I think the, the, the people that are going to win out in this space and what's ultimately going to create scale and to really help EV adoption is turnkey solutions. So people who can provide provide both the hardware, the software, and ongoing operation of the network. Mm. Um, it's part of the types of solutions that, that we're trying to address where ultimately all of our charging stations, we can remotely tap into our charging stations in real time. So if there is an issue, we can pull data logs, remotely troubleshoot, reboot, and get the charging station back online so that we don't lose out on any user experience for the EV drivers. Mm. Dustin, we, we are, though, at, at, at kind of continuing to talk about what is happening here. And Alex brings up another good point, which is, are we going to be able to make money off the energy transition? A lot of companies are really struggling with this. They're struggling because they can't get the people. They're struggling because they can't get the, the kit they need, the infrastructure, getting it in, getting it permitted. How, many, how, how, how are these problems influencing the ability to actually monetize this process and monetize it profitably? Yeah, I mean, we have a, a whole unique opportunity to create and introduce a whole new economy uh, in, in the U.S. Um, you know, this infrastructure adds a lot of value to properties. And, and so um, really, you know, there are tons of available uh, installation contractors are, that are out there and a ton of new electrical uh, vehicle charging solution companies that are, are existing. It's about getting everyone to collaborate and work together to start educating property owners on the value of putting these into their buildings and turning it into a profit center so that they can make money off of these solutions. And that comes with accessible and affordable solutions. I think uh, you know the first generation solutions that came to the market were really kind of hyper-focused on recreating what we call the traditional gas station experience. Um, that is, they're installing these kind of over-engineered, expensive public charging stations that mimic the look and feel of a gas pump, which we found to be ultimately you know, unsustainable and you know, impractical to scale. So you know, really about introducing solutions that are highly affordable and convenient for property owners, something yep. that does actually pencil out in a time frame that, that makes sense for a CapEx investment it is where the market needs to focus and where I think the Gen 2 solution providers okay. like Loop and others are, are entering. Dustin, great to catch up. Really useful stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Dustin Kavanagh of Loop Global. This is Bloomberg. These are the Camper Scouts.